All right. So we're in chapter 21. We've got one more chapter left after this. We'll be done with the book of 1 Kings. And you notice at the end of this chapter, we have another um, story about Elijah at the end here. So let's, um, let's dig into this. We're going to see how wicked Ahab is as a king in this chapter. It's a real simple, pretty straightforward uh, passage, just an overview. Obviously, we just read the entire thing where um, Ahab wants a vineyard, belongs unto another guy, belongs unto Naboth, and he wants it, and he offers him money, he offers him another vineyard, you know, whatever you want, and Naboth doesn't want to get rid of it. So as a result, Naboth ends up just getting killed and murdered just so that Ahab can get that vineyard. And we're going to get into Jezebel and how wicked she was, a wicked woman, and, um, and a little bit more into the story. But basically, that's what happens. So Naboth goes, they have, they, have, or they have Naboth get killed. Ahab goes then to take possession of the vineyard. He's like, cool, he's out of the way. Now I can just take this for myself because I want it, and I'm just going to take it. And that's when Elijah is sent to go you know, preach against him and tell him how wicked he is from God. So that, and that's, that's what happens in this entire chapter. That's the, the overview of the chapter. So let's just dig right in here now. Let's look at verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel. Just imagine that. He's a Jezreelite, and he, his vineyard is in Jezreel. Right? I mean, he's from that land. That's where he's from. And he has his possession in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So he's basically got this vineyard that's, that's kind of right next door to Ahab. Right next door, it pays real close, right nearby, it's hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Nabal, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than, than it. Or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Now keep your finger here in 1 Kings 21 and turn, if you would, to Numbers 36. Because Naboth brings up a point here. He's basically saying, you know, Ahab is propositioning. I mean, you could say there's nothing wrong inherently with, with Ahab's proposition. He's not trying to steal it from him. He's trying to purchase it from him. He's saying, hey, look, I want this land. It's, it's convenient for me. It's a nice vineyard. It's real close to my place. You know, so sell it to me. You want another vineyard? If you want to have a vineyard, I'll give you another vineyard, you know, a real good one, comparable value, whatever, you know, we, let, let, how are we going to make this work, right? And Ahab doesn't care about the Lord. He's a wicked man. He serves Belial. But Naboth does care about the Lord. He does care. He has, he has integrity. He cares about the, the land that's been given to him as an inheritance. And we're going to see it in Numbers 36, just a few verses that explain why they weren't supposed to. Because what happened was, was when the land was divided among the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, right? Moses led them out of Egypt. Then Joshua led them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. They were destroying all the enemies, all the inhabitants of the land. And then they were, they were getting their land divided up unto them by lot. So all the tribes were saying, okay, and you read through... Um, the Old Testament, you read through the laws of Moses and you can find where it just goes into all the detail, you know, from this mountain to this river to the sea, to, you know, and all the borders of whose land everything was. And it was all very specific on who it belongs to. And God was saying, look, this is your inheritance that I've given to you and that it, 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 was, it was supposed to mean something that it stays within their own tribes. And the, there's a lot of laws given about, you know, when a... When a uh, the woman marries another man, you know, she doesn't get inheritance. The, the inheritance gets passed down through the male children, through the sons, typically, you know, through the firstborn son. And that's where everything would, you know, so the inheritance stays within that, that patriarchal uh, system. And in Numbers 36, there, it, we're going to read just one small portion of this. It also talks about, the issue came up of Zelophehad. Zelophehad had, um, I think, five daughters and no sons. So he had inheritance, but because he had all daughters and the way that everything was working, they say, well, wait a minute, where is my inheritance going to go? It's just going to be lost. 
So I have children, but they're not going to get anything from it. So, you know, they, they went to Moses with this issue, say, well, what are we going to do? Is, you know, is my inheritance just going to be lost now? Because, you know, all of my daughters, are gonna, you know, when they get married off, they're just going to go and join this, maybe potentially to some other tribe or whatever. What's going to happen to my land? So what they determined was in that situation, no, the, the inheritance can pass to the daughters. And then they say, well, what if they marry someone from another tribe? then they're going to end up taking that land, you know, as the course of events go, when they, when they die or whatever, it's going to, you know, go to their children, their son in their tribe. And he said, no, and the way that they managed that was let them marry whoever they want, but they have to marry within that tribe. That way it stays within the tribe. And, and just the fact that all this is spelled out in the law is showing us that God felt like this was important. He says, it's important that you have your inheritance in your land. He also established the year of Jubilee. So every 50 years, there is, a, there is the year of Jubilee, which the way that worked is that it, it's, a, it's an excellent system. I'm going to preach an entire sermon about this at some point. I just want to make sure I have, I have it really thoroughly studied out. But basically what it was, it was, it, was a, it was an awesome system to prevent anyone from just getting overly wealthy overly powerful just owning everything and then you end up you know with with someone having this kingdom where everyone's like uh serfs right where one person kind of owns everything and everyone else is their servant and the way that that he did this is, is, is okay you can you can buy other lands for a period of time you can work the land you can do things you know people if they got into debt if they had money issues they could become bond servants to someone else, say, okay, I need help. You know, can I just work for you? I'll be your servant. And that's all fine and good, but every 50 years, it's like a reset button was, was pushed and you say, okay, once that jubilee hits, you're no longer an indentured servant. Anyone that had these debts is forgiven them. Anyone who's, who's, you know, kind of leased their land, it goes back to them. It goes, the inheritance goes back to that family, back to those people, back to their, the rightful owner. And that's the way that, that God worked everything. And, and you could still make you know, money, you could be prosperous in everything that you did, but it made sure that nobody's just collecting all of this land and just owning everything because it all went back to the inheritance of, of whoever it belongs to. And you have you know, the 12 tribes, so no one, you know, if anyone's getting powerful, even within a tribe, you have, you've got a lot of other balances, checks and balances just in general with the power structure in the nation. Very great design. Anyways, you're in Numbers 36. Let's look at this verse number seven real quick because we're going to see why Naboth is so adamant about not giving in to Ahab here. Verse number seven says, so shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel remove from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter that possesseth an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be wife unto one of the family of the tribe of her father, that the children of Israel may enjoy every man the inheritance of his fathers. Neither shall the inheritance remove from one tribe to another tribe, but every one of the tribes of the children of Israel shall keep himself to his own inheritance. So this is why Naboth is saying, no, I don't want to give this to you. I'm not going to sell you this land. I'm going to keep this land because this inheritance was given to me. And you know, another thing, because the law did allow for them to sell their land for the time, this also shows me that they, prob they weren't observing the year of Jubilee at this time. We know they weren't observing the Sabbaths because the Bible says when they, you know, that's one of the reasons they were taken into captivity. They say, oh, for, you know, the, the length of time that they were taken in captivity for had to do directly with the Sabbaths that they weren't observing. Because they had every they had years of Sabbath, so every seven years or every six years they're able to, to to work the land. And then the seventh year was the a Sabbath of rest for the land, the land itself. So if you're growing crops, you're cultivating, you're doing everything, you're working your land, they said on the seventh year, you give that land rest. The same way that every six days you could work, and then the seventh day was a Sabbath of rest. That's what the children of Israel were supposed to be doing. And then after seven uh, years of seven, right, 49 years, then you had the year of Jubilee. 
So it's, it's this great system, but it wasn't being followed. So Naboth knew, he's like, well, I'm not even going to get this back in the year of Jubilee because I, don't th I personally don't think that they were observing that since they weren't even observing the, the Sabbath years to let the land rest. He's like, there's no way this is getting back to me. So there's no way I'm going to give this to you because this is the inheritance of my fathers. God forbid that I would get rid of this and, and have this land now go and be a part of another tribe. Naboth knew God's word and he had integrity. Look at how Ahab responds now in verse number four. Because Ahab really wants it. Verse four says, uh, back in 1 Kings 21, of course. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. Now this, this always makes me kind of chuckle. I just think like, what a little spoiled brat Ahab was. I mean, that really is what he is. The, the description that we're given in the Bible is like a little child. Oh, I'm going to go and pout. I don't want to eat anything. Oh, I'm so sick. Oh, I didn't get my way. Spoiled little Ahab who gets everything that he wants. Someone actually told him no. And he's acting like a little child, a little baby. Men, you know, men don't pout. When something doesn't go your way, that is not behavior of, of, of a manly man. And we know Ahab was not a manly man. We know even when God said, you're going to win this victory, he's like, well, who's going to lead it? You are, Ahab. Come on, you're the king. Step it up. And, and you know, we, you got Elijah killing the, pre, the prophets of, of Belial, which was a righteous thing, but Ahab's just like letting him do it. You got Jezreel, his wife, you know, telling him what to do and killing the prophets of the Lord, and he's letting her do that. And he was such a weak individual that it was just kind of like, whatever people are going to do, he was just going to let them do it. And then just sulk about it and pout about it. And, you know, I don't know, I'm not getting my way. Ahab was a wicked man, and he didn't have a backbone. That was his biggest problem, is that he didn't have a backbone to just do what he was going to do. Right or wrong, I mean, just do what he was going to do. He was also very covetous. And this is a huge problem. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Covetousness is a huge problem. I think it is one of the most underpreached uh, uh, sins in Christian churches by and large. And one of the biggest problems I think believers have is with covetousness. The Bible is very, very, very clear about how wicked of a sin covetousness is. And if you don't know what covetousness is, it's when you're looking on something else, if you're lusting after something else that doesn't belong to you, something that you can't have, that someone else has, and you want that, that is a sin. Do you hear me? That's a sin. So if you have no means of getting it, there, there's multiple ways of this. You know, one is being covetous of, say, someone else's wife or someone else's husband. That husband or wife belongs to the other person, their spouse. They do not belong to you, and it's wicked for you to want, wish you had someone else's spouse because you could never have that person. They belong to someone else, and that is pure wickedness in your heart if you're coveting after someone else's spouse. That's one aspect. Another one is, let's say you don't have the means to acquire something for yourself. You see someone driving around in a Ferrari, right? And look, I don't know everyone's financial situation here, but I think I know enough that no, no one's in the situation to go put a down payment on a Ferrari, right? Anyone got a, a, an extra $100,000 laying around that you just don't know what to do with? I didn't think so. When you look at objects like that and you go, oh man, I wish I, wish I had one of those, you just sin. That is covetousness. And so many people don't even realize, like, that's a sin. And you want to watch all these TV shows and you watch Cribs and you watch, what, I, don't even know, I don't even know if that's still out there, but all these shows where it's, it's showing all these rich and lavish lifestyles and you look at these people and you start to come and be like, oh man, what it must be like to live that type of a life. That is wickedness. That is wickedness. Hebrews 13, 5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
What God gives you, what God has provided for you in this life ought to be enough for you. You could say, thank you, Lord, for what you've given me and not be the spoiled brat like Ahab and say, oh, I wish I had this. Oh, I wish I had that. Oh, I wish I had a bigger house. Oh, I wish I had more vehicles. Oh, I wish I had more money. That's covetousness. There's a huge problem that Ahab had. And as a result of Ahab's covetousness, a godly man died. Naboth died. Lost his life as a result of a sinful man. Wicked, covetous heart. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Just to, to stress how big of a deal covetousness is. It's listed here as one of the sins that will get you kicked out of church. If someone in this church has a covetous heart, they're going to be asked to leave until they can get right with God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, He's looking at a fornicator. Oh, yeah, I can understand that. You know, we shouldn't have people just allowed to be called brothers in the church. Someone who's been in the church for a while just be a fornicator. Going off and sleeping around, right? That is a serious sin. That is something you're not allowed. Hey, you can't just have this, this testimony and just show everyone, hey, yeah, I'm a brother in Christ and I believe in the Bible everything. And you're going off and just whoring around and being a fornicator. Obviously, Sorry, buddy, you got you to get right with God. Get out of here until you get right and then come back. But we're not going to tolerate that. See, we have a line in the sand. We have a, a level, an expectation of how you're going to live your life if you're going to be a part, a member of this church and call yourself a brother. There is an expectation to keep in this congregation, in this fellowship of believers. Because a little leaven leavens a whole lump. When you start allowing that sin to get in, you know, you don't want people, especially like children or people newer in the faith. Oh, wow. So-and-so's been coming to church for 10 years and he's out just sleeping around, going out to the bar every night and coming home with a new girlfriend. I guess that must be okay. Of course not. And you're causing the weaker brethren to stumble and even those that maybe aren't as weak, casting a, a snare before them too. Because what happens is every, everybody does this. I don't care who you are. You look at someone else that maybe you look up to, someone who's been in the faith for a while, and if you see something that they do, oh, wow, so-and-so is doing this, it must be okay. Even more so with pastors. You know, I mean, people look at pastors, like, oh, wow, pastor's doing this? Well, it must be okay then. And then they start doing everything. And that's why it's so important for a pastor to live, I mean, try to live an extremely separated lifestyle just to make sure that, that they're not causing stumbling blocks in front of everyone else. Now, as church members, you need to remember that pastors aren't perfect. So if they're doing something that you don't think is right or is a sin, but I mean, obviously we're not talking about one of these major sins, but they're doing something, you know, don't just think, well, if they're doing it, then it's okay. You need to live your life, you know, in according to what, how God is going to judge you, not according to what other people do. Amen. But look at this in, in verse number 11. We'll keep reading here. It says, if any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. Don't even go out to lunch with a person like that. And look, you, you, you take covetous out for a second. You've got a fornicator, you've got someone, an idolater, right? Someone who's worshiping idols. Someone's got some idol set up that they are putting before God. Well, that makes sense. A railer. Someone just, just railing on other people in the church, or railing on people, you know, like, just baseless accusations, railing on people. Yeah, I could understand that too. You don't want someone like that in your congregation. A drunkard. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. Or an extortioner, right? Holding things over you, trying to get something out of you, extorting money out of you, extorting whatever, and, and blackmailing people, whatever. Those all make sense. But don't read over covetous. And the reason why people want to read over that is because so many people are guilty of having a covetous heart in today's society because we're being crammed with all of the commercialism, the commercials on the radio, on the TV, on the internet, anywhere you put your eyes, on billboards, everywhere you're being sold on something and being told why what you have isn't that good and why you need this. It's an entire mindset. 
that is out there today of commercialism where people are trying to sell you and sell stuff to you and to get you into this frame of mind into not being content with such things as you have. We need to remain content and remember that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. That God is the source of the good things we have in our life. And if you focus on what you don't have, you're going to be miserable and nothing is ever going to be enough for you. Oh, I wish I had a new stove. Oh, I wish I had a new refrigerator. Oh, I wish I had these new, uh, a new car, a new house, whatever. All these various things you get wrapped up in. Why don't you thank God you have a roof over your head? Why don't you thank God you got clothes on your back? Thank God you got a job. You focus on what you do have, you're going to be a lot happier than you focus on, on what you don't have. You're going to be miserable. Nothing will ever be enough. And on top of that, you're sinning and you're wicked because you're not appreciating what God has done for you. You look at the children of Israel as a perfect example of that when Moses led them out of Egypt and they start complaining about all the things they used to have when they were in slavery, when they were in bondage, when they had to work from morning to night and the taskmasters were over them and they weren't free to do what they wanted to do. And in their wicked hearts, because they're out in the wilderness for a while and they're roughing it, and they don't have all of the things that they had, now they're going to start just, just saying things against God or saying things, um, murmuring, complaining. Oh man, it used to be so much better back when we were in bondage, back when I was a slave. It's like going to prison for a while and then you get out and you don't have any money because you've been in prison for so long, it's a hard time finding a job. And you're just like, well, at least in prison I had, you know, three meals a day. It's like, you were in a cage. Like, can you enjoy your freedom? And maybe you don't have as many meals now and you got to work harder and you got to, you know, can you at least thank God you're free? And, and the big things we seem to just gloss over for the little things that cause us a little bit of hardship. Oh, I don't have all the conveniences in the world. And, and, and it blows my mind, especially in today's day and age. So quick people are to forget of, of how new, really, in, in, the, in, the in, in all of time, all of these appliances that we have now, the electricity even, to run all the appliances and to do all these things, it's like, no one had that before. Oh, a, a dish, I did a dishwasher. You know what a dishwasher has always been historically? A person using water that they went down to the lake or to the river or whatever they hauled up to use and did everything by hand and then laid it out to dry or dried it with a no. I mean, that was a dishwasher. It was a person doing manual labor. Clothing, everything, everything was done. Way more work and people now want to get all upset and complain because you don't have all the, the newest things and toys and gadgets and phones and whatever. Whatever it is. It's ridiculous. I bet God's up in heaven going like, what a bunch of Ahab, you spoiled little brats. I bless you with all this stuff and then when you don't have even more, you're going to start complaining about it. Be thankful for what you have. Praise God for it. The Bible says that we aren't even supposed to eat with someone who has a covetous heart. Now look, we may all be guilty of, of, of one, you know, something from time to time. You may catch yourself in a moment. This is talking about someone who's just you know, filled with covetousness. Look at verse number 12. It says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Basically saying, yes, we are supposed to judge within the church when people are involved in these types of serious sins to judge and not to eat with them. Verse 13, But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Covetous is in the list. The covetous person is a wicked person according to the Bible. And yes, you could be a saved person and be a wicked person. Because this is talking about people in the church. You can be a drunkard and be saved. 
You could be a railer and be saved. You could be an extortioner, believe it or not, and be saved. You could be, you know, any of these things and be saved. Do you want, do you want God referring to you as some wicked person? No, I wouldn't. Go back if you would to 1 Kings chapter 21. We see Ahab's problem being just being covetous and not being content with what I mean he's the king it's, he's got a palace right he, he, and he wants this vineyard oh it's convenient for me because it's right next to my palace think about how ridiculous that is like there's so many people in Israel I'm sure that weren't living in palaces and that probably had to sell their lands because they were in such hard times you know they couldn't do anything else and he's like, oh, I don't want to eat anything. I'm so upset. Naboth won't give me his vineyard. I offered to pay him for it, but he won't give it to me because of God, because of the Lord. It's the attitude that, Na that Ahab had. Now, what we're going to find, though, also in this chapter is that Ahab was extremely wicked. The Bible says he was more wicked than, um, than Jeroboam and then Baasha. But I don't think that he would have done nearly as much wickedness as he did if he had a spine and didn't let his wife influence him on everything that he did. Because she was the one that provoked him to. And we're going to read that in a little bit. The Bible actually says that she caused him to get in to so much sin. So, you know, another lesson is get a spine, men. Don't act like a spoiled brat and, and don't let anybody just rule over you as far as telling you what you're going to do. You need to determine what's right and wrong. And you need to stand up for what's right and do what's right. Amen. Verse number five. See, Jezebel hears about him, his, his little tantrum here. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she's saying, well, aren't you the king? I mean, can't you just go and take whatever you want? I mean, you're the king, right? Just take it. But she's like, oh, don't worry. Don't, don't worry, poor little Ahab. Poor little boy. I'll take care of that for you. And, and keep, uh, pay attention to these words. It's going to be important a little bit. She said, she told him, I will give thee the vineyard. Verse number 18, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial before him to, to bear witness against him saying, thou didst blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. And then it goes on and just basically says exactly the same thing, how they did everything that was just written. So her plan is, okay, I'll get this for you. She writes letters. She writes them to the governors and the people who are in charge of the land. Some more wicked people that see her entire wicked plan of saying, hey, we're going to frame this guy, Naboth, a godly man. We're going to frame him. I want you to set him up. We're going to proclaim a fast and we're going to set this guy up. We're going to exalt him. And then you're going to come out with two guys that are going to bear false witness against him, lie about him and get him put to death. And that's the way it's going to be. And Jezebel sends out those letters and these some more, probably some spineless leaders or just extremely wicked, just as wicked as Jezebel leaders, or probably both, go along with it and say, oh, okay, Jezebel wants this done, so I guess we'll get it done. They're probably scared of her. 
because of how wicked she was and how many people she had put to death. But um, so she sets up these two people. Again, it says children of Belial. These devil worshipers, they don't have a problem with it. Say, okay, yeah, we'll lie about it. No big deal. No problem. And they lift Naboth up. The presence of the people, they say Naboth did blaspheme. You know, these two liars, these two witnesses. And then they carry him out and they kill him. And they stone him. Jump down here to uh, verse number 14. The Bible says, Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. What a wicked man. Yeah. Oh, he's dead? Oh, okay, I guess I'll just go and take it. Verse 16, and it came to pass when Ahab heard, oh, I said verse 17, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is go down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him. So God comes to Elijah and says, I'm sending you to preach against Ahab. Here's what I want you to say. And pay attention to what he, has, what he has Elijah say to Ahab. Don't forget, Jezebel is the one who, who planned everything. She wrote the letter. She said, I'll get this for you. And she's the one ultimately that has Naboth killed. Right? Very clear. Verse number 19. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even nine. Who does God hold responsible for the killing of Naboth? Ahab. Did Ahab write the letters? Did Ahab concoct the plan for, for Naboth to be set on high and for him to be killed? No. But who did God hold responsible? Ahab. Very important to notice that. God holds Ahab responsible, even though he didn't do any of that stuff himself. And this concept of guilt is found elsewhere in the Bible. Who killed Uriah the Hittite? Well, he was killed in battle, right? The enemy killed Uriah the Hittite. Well, Joab's the one that put him in, the, in the, the hottest part of the battle, right? You know who God holds responsible? David. In 2 Samuel 12, 9, the Bible says, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Children of Ammon were the ones that killed Uriah. But David was the one responsible for the children of Ammon killing him. And God is coming down on David. God comes down on Ahab. Even Jesus Christ himself. Who killed Jesus? And a lot of people have problems with this today. I don't know why. It's because they're Jew lovers and worshipers of a, a Christ-rejecting nation of people that will have nothing to do with Jesus Christ, but they just love him so much for who knows why, because they've been lied to and deceived by the Schofield Reference Bible and whoever else is just teaching damnable doctrines. The Bible itself says in Acts chapter 3, I'm going to read this in context for you. Acts chapter 3 and verse number 12, the Bible reads, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel. Who's he addressing? The men of Israel. The children of Israel. Is he, arresting, is he addressing the Romans? Is he addressing the government? Is he addressing Caesar or, or any of those people, the soldiers? No. Ye men of Israel. Why marvel ye at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go, but ye denied the Holy One. You men of Israel, ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life. Who killed the prince of life? Ye men of Israel. The Jews. 
There's other places that says it too, but in Acts chapter 3, because what people say, oh, no, 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 it wasn't them. It was, just, it was just the Pharisees. It was just the rulers. Well, we'll keep reading. And killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it. He said, I know that you are ignorant, and that's why you did it. But then he says, as did also your rulers. So is he just talking about the rulers? Does the blame only on the rulers? Is it only on the Pharisees? No, it's on the men of Israel. It's on all of them as a group, as a whole, because they all said, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be on us and on our children. He came unto his own, his own received him not. They are responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, so what do you want to do? Go out and kill all the Jews today? No. No, but why would you deny? The, I mean, the, the people that did that aren't even alive anymore anyways. We're not just carrying forward this generational thing of just saying, well, you're, you know, just like they want to do with slavery and everything else. So you're responsible because people hundreds of years ago did something. Now you have to pay for it. That's ridiculous. But the Bible is very clear about who gets the responsibility. And when you are in a position of authority, take it seriously. Ahab was the king. When Ahab has letters sent in his name with his stamp, with his stamp of approval on it, guess who's responsible for that? Ahab. It didn't matter that his wife wrote the letters. His stamp went on that. He's responsible for that. When you have a position of authority, no matter who you are, you need to take it seriously. Ahab was responsible for the kingdom and the orders made in his name. You may be in a position at work where you have authority. Look, when you have an employee, if you're an employer and you have other people doing things, you're a manager, you got people working for you, and one of your employees does something, look, at, you're going to have a level of responsibility for that because you're the one in charge of making sure that your employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Or in the household, fathers, you've been given authority and responsibility if people in your family are doing things that you don't approve of and you don't like and going up, you know, when they're in your household, you know who's responsible for that? You are. Don't pass the buck off to someone else. You can't. The ultimate responsibility lies with you. Now, mothers, you have, a, you have your own responsibility too. You've got a responsibility with raising your children, but at the end of the day, the buck stops at the, at the, the head of the household, the one in charge ultimately. And that's the man of the house. And that's why it's so important that you need to make sure that you are running your house the way that you see fit. And you do what needs to be done. And don't let your wife, don't let your children, don't let anyone else walk all over you and tell you the way things are going to be. You are the one that's responsible. Ahab wasn't responsible in his house. He was held responsible. But he was letting his wife do all the decision making. And his wife was wicked. You don't have to have a wicked wife to, to still have problems in your household because you're not making decisions. If God put you in charge, then you take that responsibility and you do it. There's a reason why you're put in charge. Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to pick up here in verse number 20. Where Ahab, where, um, excuse me, Elijah confronts Ahab. Verse number 20, And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Ahab sold himself to do evil. He's just, he doesn't care, right? He wanted his vineyard, so he got what he wanted, Right? He didn't care that Jezebel is doing whatever she wants in his name and getting people killed. He sold himself to do evil just so that he can fulfill his covetousness on the field that he wanted. And that's kind of the way that he lived his life. Look at verse number 21. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity, 
and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat and like the house of Baasha the son of Ahijah for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. So Jezebel isn't free from her own responsibility either. God sees all of her wickedness as well. He's saying, she's going to suffer just like you. But Ahab, don't think that you're free from, from uh, being held responsible for these actions because your name was on it. Verse number 24. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Look at this. Whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And that's what I was saying before. You know, without Jezebel's wicked wife in the picture, or at least if Ahab had more of a backbone, he probably wouldn't done quite as wickedly as he had done. But he allowed his wife to stir him up and just to do even more wickedly. Verse number 26, And he did very abom abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So, you know, basically the, uh, the judgment that came against Ahab and Jezebel was that they're going to die just like some rotten death and they're just going to be eaten of the dogs. And if they're in the field, the birds are going to eat. You know, it's just like they're not going to get a proper burial. They're not going to have respect even to their remains. They're going to die. And they're just going to be in the gutter, in the street, just being eaten by dogs. And not only that, his posterity is going to be cut off, meaning all of his children gone. They're going to be wiped out. His whole lineage, his inheritance, right? He wanted to steal the inheritance from Naboth. And because of that, his inheritance is getting wiped out. It's a serious thing. You gotta, we need to remember this. I preached a sermon on this recently on the sins that you commit and the repercussions they could have upon your family, upon your posterity. Think about how much you love your family before you go getting off into some extremely wicked sin, extremely extreme covetousness or whatever. You think it's not going to affect anyone else, but it will. It will. It'll come back and it'll hurt your family. You say, I'm willing to go through whatever God gives me. Yeah, well, the judgment might not, might not just fall on you. It might also fall upon your children. Don't forget that. Ahab pushed things too far with God. He, God is long-suffering and merciful and, and is forgiving, but Ahab crossed the line. And that's why his entire posterity gets cut off. And God says, that's it. And even when he humbles himself, the judgment's still coming. Now, he did gain something by humbling himself. It wasn't for nothing, but he crossed the line. And God's just saying, there's no coming back from you. No amount of humbling yourself is going to make up for everything that you've done and your wickedness. You're still getting cut off, but I'm going to give you a little bit more time because you've humbled yourself. Last point. We finished the chapter already. Notice God sent Elijah to Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king. But God had that message specifically for Ahab. Now, I don't think that Ahab was saved. I think he, you know, he worshiped Belial and stuff, but he could have been. It's possible, right? I mean, you can't, you know, without knowing his heart, he could have been. I haven't seen anything that would just say, no, he is just a total reprobate. I mean, he could, have, he, could have been, he could have been a believer. And the reason why I say this is because all the things that, that he's done, you know, can still be a believer. Either way, though, whether he is or isn't, God sends his preachers for a reason. And notice that the preaching that's necessary here, and it, and it worked, right? It's a hellfire and damnation type of preaching. It's judgment that's coming. Elijah goes to Ahab, and he's not afraid of him. He said, oh, you found me, my enemy. 
right? And, he, and, he's, and he's confrontational right off the bat. Ahab is. He's, he's, you know, he doesn't want to hear from Elijah, but Elijah's going to tell him anyways because he says, thus saith the Lord. And he says, you're going to, you know, it's a, very, it's a very negative message to a very powerful person. But this isn't the first time we see We see this happen in many places. This reminds me of, you know, God sent Jonah to Nineveh. Nineveh was a wicked city. People were involved with all kinds of wickedness. Jonah didn't want to go. But God said, no, you have a message that I want you to preach. And it was a negative message. He said, God's going to bring destruction, right? It's a hellfire and brimstone. God's mad. He's going to destroy you. It's exactly what Elijah was saying to Ahab. God is mad and he's going to destroy you. He's going to cut off your posterity. And you know why these types of sermons are preached? And you know why it's so necessary? It's because God wants you to be humble. He wants you to say, admit, I did wrong. Acknowledge your sin. Have a contrite spirit and show God that you're sorry, that you're wrong. And you can receive mercy. The whole city of Nineveh received mercy because they repented in sackcloth and ashes. It's not fun to preach the negative sermon. It's not fun to go off and, and, you know, and to tell people, destruction's coming. People don't want to hear that. But the whole purpose is because some people will receive it and some people will humble themselves and get right with God and that can postpone or even completely uh, change a, a destruction from coming as it did with the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was not, an entire city was not destroyed because they humbled themselves. This is why we preach hard. You know, so many, oh, why, why do you got to yell? Why do you got to scream? Why do you got to talk about these things? Why do you got to talk about all this sin and stuff? Because people need to change. If you're in wickedness and, and, and you're having God's anger come upon you, you know, you ought to change and get right with God. Humble yourself. God's merciful. I mean, even the Ahab, you see the mercy that he received. He still was going to get judged, but like, Ahab was, did pretty wickedly. When it, when it compares him to, to Jeroboam and to Baasha, he was extremely wicked. But because he humbled himself, this is the whole point. Being able to say, I'm wrong. God's right. That is the point of the, of the hard preaching. So don't get, and don't get mad at the preacher. You know, Ahab could get mad at, at, could have gotten mad at Elijah all he wants and called him his enemy. Right? And not looked at him as someone who's actually there to help him because he's given him the word of the Lord. Don't get mad at the messenger. Don't get mad at God. Just receive what, what God has for us. And you know, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a swift rebuke that we need to get in order to get back right with God. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for your word. God, we thank you for um, the instruction that we receive from your word, dear God. I pray that you would please help us all to, to remain humble. Help us not to be covetous, dear Lord, and to be desiring things that we can't have or shouldn't have or um, not being, and not being content with the things that we do have, dear Lord. Help us to maintain a, a right attitude. And um, I pray that you please help the men to have a, a backbone and a spine and not to let other people just dictate everything that they're going to do, but that they could determine what's right from your word, dear Lord, and to stand fast and to not, uh, not be moved or shaken from doing what's right, dear Lord. We ask for your blessing upon our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.